the streaming. Oh. <laughs> Just one second. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Raquel Garcia. I'm a candidate to the European Parliament for T66, my party in the Netherlands. And I have just been told that I need to move from this table to a different place. So I'm just going to take my computer with me because that's the good thing about a laptop. And I'm going to move to the stairs next door. So just give me two seconds and I will start answering your questions right away. See, that's a good thing about Europe. It provides great connectivity. And that's one of the things that we cannot miss for the next few years and we have to ensure that we provide that for everyone so moving to a different location sorry about that organizers this was an unprepared pitch but i'm here and i am ready to talk and dialogue with europeans from all around the continent so there we are I'm sorry, where's the meeting? Because I'm also uh, standing... I'm live right now. Yeah, so whatever, where's the meeting? Which meeting? I'm also standing candidate. Okay. That's for the European Parliament. Yeah. Where, where is it? Can you Room see? 6, I think. Room 6. Yes. Go left, it's not everything. I don't see any questions uh, coming in. Let's see. So in the meantime, I will tell a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, as I said, uh, my name is Raquel Garcia. I am a candidate to the European Parliament for Dutch Party, D66. Uh, D66 is a member of ALDE, the Liberal Alliance. And I am originally from Spain and I live in the Netherlands since uh, 2012. I came to the Netherlands as an Erasmus student um, for the love. And uh, I decided to stay, and since then I have uh, started up a family here in this uh, country, which has become my own. And I'm looking forward to speaking with all of you about my experience with, it, with the European Union and what it has meant for me and what it still means for me and for my family. And uh, looking forward to answer to all of your questions about how I see the future of our union and uh, my ideas for the European Parliament in years to come. There's a phone call coming in. Maybe I will get new instructions. Aha, I see the question. Sorry about that. Yes. Okay. Um, first questions. We read the Alder Manifesto and we do not see uh, culture in it. Why is that? Well, I'm afraid I cannot really explain why there's something in or not in the whole ALDE manifesto. I do know that the ALDE manifesto had to bring in a lot of input from many different parties because we have a lot of different parties active in a lot of the European Union countries. And um, it was a matter of prioritizing. But what I can say is that my own party, D66 in the Netherlands, uh, does have culture as a very important part of our program. And we don't only do that on a national level, but also on a European level. And we believe that European culture is one, um, one of the elements that glues us together, that generates connection and a feeling of belonging for people. And we would like to see more promotion of European arts and culture throughout the continent. And that's why we 
propose very specific things, such as, for example, the creation of a European museum card, which would enable for more people to access the huge European culture heritage in a more um, accessible way, in a more affordable way, and in a more egalitarian way for all Europeans. That was a question from Rosa P. Monclus. Another question from uh, Sophie Dowden. Uh, Erasmus Plus is a very successful and well-loved program. Would you like to see it expanded? Yes, absolutely. I am, uh, as I said in the introduction, I am a, an Erasmus student myself, or was an Erasmus student. Um, thanks to the Erasmus program, I was allowed to come from Spain to the Netherlands without having to interrupt my study. And um, for D66, it's very important that we expand this program, not only in terms of budget, which obviously is a very important point, in terms of scope. Um, right now, the Erasmus program is only accessible for students of higher uh, education in universities and um, de depending on the country, it's university of a slightly uh, lower degree. What we would like to see is that also technical degrees and less academic theoretical degrees also have access to Europeans. Uh, we don't see any reason why a student of um, a student who's uh, uh, um, preparing herself or himself to become a hairdresser, uh, to name something, should not be able to study uh, at a different school in a different country. So that is something that is in our program and um, is a definitely important point for also other parties within our parliamentary fraction in ALDI. And uh, we hope that we will be able to use the next term in the European Parliament to achieve that. And that was a question yeah, from Sophie Dowden. Um, Caroline Oder, o Oclair, sorry. Caroline Oclair uh, asks, uh, hello, how do you think the European institutions, uh, especially the European Parliament and the Commission, should involve the cultural sector in developing their policies? Yes, um, well, culture is a shared competence uh, within the European Union, and it's not very clear what the, the, the competence of the Commission of the, or the Parliament uh, here has to be, whether it's more support of the member states or it's more uh, directive or executive. We do think, like I said before, that um, the cultural sector is part of our European identity, of our joint identity, and it should be promoted as such. Um, there are a lot of things that make us Europeans, and one of them is our shared uh, culture. So we do think that there should be support, especially for those initiatives that uh, promote and um, highlight that joint European uh, culture. At the end of the day, it's obviously a matter of priority. It's obviously a matter of budgeting. Um, but we do think that it deserves more attention, and it should be done um, in, in very practical ways which can also help the member states in their own cultural initiatives. So the European Museum card, for instance, is one of them, um, um, one of the proposals that is in our program. And obviously to make that work, we do need the support of the cultural institutions and the cultural sector in the different countries because we can have the best idea for a European Museum card. But if Europe's main musea, uh, museums are not uh, behind that, then it's not going to work. So yes, uh, the Parliament and the Commission do have a responsibility to involve all um, stakeholders in their uh, in the develop developing of their policies. So we think that um, the cultural sector should be also involved. Um, from Chelsea Ryder, uh, I read, what is in your opinion the responsibility of politics for ensuring adequate in infrastructure and funding to enable the performance, preservation, and promotion of arts and art education at all levels? And what contribution do you expect from hired art education institutions? Um, as I said before, uh, um, education, well, first of all, it should be said that education is a competence that is still within the member states. So it is, that also goes for higher education and it should be uh, to member states to decide how they want to organize that. But given that we do have a European higher education space and given that we believe that the European institutions should take a more, um, more prominent role in the promotion of culture, we also think that there should be uh, that promotion on the arts and art education level. 
as I said before, we do want the Erasmus program to be expanded to students not only for um, higher education institutions, and that depends on the European country. In some countries, arts uh, education, cultural education does not belong to the highest level of education. It's a level below, and that, may, that means that the students do not qualify for an Erasmus uh, grant. Um, we think that's fundamentally wrong. We don't see any practical reason for that other than budget, but that can be solved. And uh, we would like to see the program expanded to cover also the arts education. Looking for more questions here. They're all very interested. Thank you so much for sending questions. And I see, according to the names, that they're coming from all over the place. So, uh, so that's, that's very nice. Um, Alex, Alex Mesmer, I hope that I'm saying that right, asks, uh, what is uh, my idea of a sustainable future? Now, my idea of a sustainable future um, is quite broad because I do see sustainability in a very broad way. My own professional experience ha has take, taken me from uh, environmental protection to protection of human rights, those of uh, uh, indigenous and tribal peoples, to protection of animals, which is the sector where I currently work. And of course, my political involvement um, is very focused also on those themes. So when I think of sustainability, I think of, uh, uh, of course, subjects like climate change and the energy transition. But I also think of how are we going to ensure that everyone in the world has access to similar opportunities without um, destroying the planet along the way. My idea for a sustainable future is one also where everyone is free to decide what and who they want to be in all circumstances. That is one of the key, uh, component, the, the key uh, values uh, uh, um, of, of D66, of my party, and I fully believe in that. We should all be free no matter what we are, and certainly not no matter where we are in the European Union, um, should be free to decide our identity. We should be free to decide if uh, we love a man or we love a woman or none. We should be free to decide if uh, uh, we're going to dedicate our life to um, working for an NGO or we want to work for the private sector. We should have the same access to a high quality education. Um, without all of those components of also uh, social equality, but freedom to um, determine ourselves and who we are, um, I do not believe that anything is very sustainable because ultimately, there will be um, a clash and a, a conflict between the people who have more and the people who have less, between the people who have access to chances, to opportunities, and the people who don't. Um, and of course, there will be a conflict bef between uh, those who um, keep spending the resources of our country, of our planet and our countries as if there was no tomorrow, and those of us who do believe that we do need to share those and uh, take care of those wisely. Let me see, more questions coming in. Um, Cornelia Keys, a very, very, very interesting question, especially for me. Uh, which policy decisions would you take from the member state level to the European level if, uh, if I could? Um, well, <laughs> two things that are uh, quite important for me on a personal level, for, but also uh, um, the second one also for my party, uh, are competences which right now are quite heavily on the member state level, and I would like to see uh, arranged at a more uh, European level. The first of them is um, animal welfare. As I said before, I do work in the animal welfare sector. It's part of my vision of a sustainable future and a sustainable present. And right now, uh, the European Union can take very few decisions on the basis, actually none, on the basis of pure animal welfare, because that is a competence of the member states. This is extremely harmful for animals, but also for people, for public health, for public safety, uh, for our common market. It has a lot of different elements, and I would like to see that at least shared as a competence between the European Union and the member states. The second one, which uh, for D66, my party is a very important one, is that we would like to see a truly joint European defense and a truly joint uh, or united European army. Why? Um, the current situation is that 
every member state and every country uh, arranges their uh, defense expenditure, defense, sorry, defense expenditure, the military expen expenditure on their own, and they all have their own um, decision-making power in this uh, regard. And that's good for some, some things. Some people believe that that is how you will preserve eventually sovereignty. I don't. I believe that a joint European army, a joint European defense strategy, especially on a defensive from a defensive perspective, is something that we do need in order to be able to protect our interests in the world. And we do live in a quite complex uh, world where um, there are countries like Russia and China who are investing heavily in their defense. We are also living in a situation where we cannot really rely anymore on the United States as a typical ally, as it has always been, at least not currently. And we believe that we need to show that we can act together if that was ever needed. Beyond that, it would be much more efficient from an economic perspective if we could sum all of our defense expenditure and uh, uh, ensure that countries are not competing against each other and ensure that um, we can equip our troops in a more, um, well, in, in an adequate way and a more efficient way to protect all Europeans and to protect also citizens throughout the world because let's not forget the vast majority of European military missions are of um, uh, have a human rights protection component and a defensive component. From Angela Russo, I get a question, as a former Erasmus, what would you identify as the main challenges for students going on an exchange? For example, finding accommodation, recognition and cultural shock due to lack of information were mentioned often. How should the new program approach those challenges? Ah, that's a, a very, a very good question. Indeed, uh, finding accommodation is one of the main issues that I hear that um, students have difficulty with, especially when they come into countries like the Netherlands, where the housing market is already quite problematic, even for the people who live here. Um, I'm not really sure that the European Union has a lot of competence to arrange that. Um, I do think that the program itself could provide a bit more guidance and a bit more support to students when they're looking for a house. I do know from my experience coming from Spain to the Netherlands that support was very, very limited. And I do know that a lot of my um, fellow students um, had quite a bit of difficulty in finding adequate, um, adequate uh, housing. Um, of course, that's a matter of resources as well. Um, there is a lot to be said about the way that countries are deciding to spend their Erasmus budgets in a very um, different way. It's not at all um, homo homogenous throughout all countries. So, for example, some countries decide to spend uh, to send fewer students, but give them a much larger uh, financial allowance, which helps them find a, a house in a easier way. And some uh, some countries, like Spain, for example, chooses to send a lot of students away, but then with a very small allowance. Um, that's undesirable because, among other reasons, it forces um, or it forces, it prevents students from less privileged um, uh, backgrounds with uh, less money to spend. Um, it prevents them to, to actually go on an Erasmus. That's something that I've seen a lot in Spain, people who really would like to go um, a year abroad, but they couldn't. Um, so I do think that the European Union should be uh, a bit more directive in the way that countries are deciding to, um, um, yeah, to, to spend their allocated budget for this program. Cultural shock, yes, uh, cultural shock. Well, when you migrate, and I've migrated a couple of times in my life already, there's always a degree of cultural shock. But I do think, in a way, that's actually positive because it's right at the moment when you leave your home and your, your safety zone and your safety net, uh, that you realize that uh, things can be different elsewhere. But actually, after that initial shock, um, well, that can be less or more traumatic depending on where you end up and, and I guess on your, your personal attitude as well. Um, after the cultural shock, um, I do think that what we encounter as Erasmus students and as migrants at large, is that the similarities between our, our cultures, especially in a European background, 
are uh, more than the differences. And I do think that that is one of the most beautiful experiences of being an Erasmus student and actually deciding to stay in the country after you are done with your Erasmus or deciding to go to another country, especially within the European Union, is that we all share some degree of common background, common history, common story as migrants. And um, I do think that we have to cherish that. And I, I consider the Erasmus program to be one of the biggest uh, successes of the uh, European project, but also one of the biggest and most effective integration motors. So um, I hope that we keep protecting and uh, promoting it. More questions, let me refresh. Uh, Lucy Susova uh, asks about my journey from Spain and if I could tell you how governments can ensure a balance between enriching experience abroad and the brain drain. How do we ensure social and equal Europe? That is a very good question. Um, obviously, there is quite a bit of transfer of uh, uh, especially the, 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 um, um, the younger people from countries uh, from the uh, former European bloc, uh, sorry, Eastern European bloc to Western Europe, but also from Southern Europe to Northern Europe. It's something that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's causing uh, uh, quite a bit of problems in some countries. Um, my party, D66, is very aware of that. And we try to find a balance between um, what I started by uh, one of, in one of the first questions, um, the search for equality within our Europe, but also the freedom for people to decide where they want to live, where they want to work, where they want to create their families. And um, those two things uh, need to be combined in the European social policy. On the one hand, we need to protect our freedom of movement and our freedom to decide where we work. But on the other hand, we need to ensure that that is not um, because the conditions, uh, the working conditions in some countries are so massively uh, better than in other countries. Of course, a difference is probably going to be there for a very long time. It's not the same to uh, work in Spain than to work in the Netherlands or to work in Poland than to work in Austria. But we do need to ensure that there is a, a basic minimum of good working conditions for everyone. D66 is a very, very strong supporter of the European Labour Authority uh, to ensure that labour conditions are equivalent or not equivalent, but similar um, in, in the different countries, that uh, people have access to uh, a decent working place, to a decent uh, um, uh, safety net if they cannot work anymore, that people are not being exploited in countries where uh, they have migrated. And we do see a lot in Western Europe still that uh, migrants from other countries end up in horrible situations, for example, in substandard housing, uh, uh, earning, uh, obviously illegally, uh, much less than minimum salary. That is something that should be arranged in a European way with a central authority that controls that the working conditions and the labor conditions are similar across the board. And that is also a part of a fair playing field so that companies cannot uh, uh, choose to establish themselves there where they can exploit workers the most. I think I have another page of questions. That's going really well. Thanks so much. Um, this is a very good one also. Uh, Jasmina Lashovic. Uh, are democratic values in Europe today under threat? Well, my answer would be yes. Yes, they are. Sadly, they are. Uh, we do see that in certain countries there are uh, parties in the government which are displaying complete disdain from um, our core European democratic values. I uh, have no problem mentioning by name, for example, what's happening in uh, Poland with uh, discrimination of the uh, uh, LGTB community, so with, with uh, rights for uh, gays and lesbian transsexuals. We have to look at Hungary with what's happening with the rule of law um, under the rule of uh, Viktor Orban. I would also like to mention that, in my opinion, it's 
quite shameful that the European People's Party has not definitively and uh, without conditions expelled uh, Viktor Orban from their midst and that they're still sitting together in their, um, in their um, uh, fraction in the European Parliament. Um, but we also see that in maybe less obvious ways, but uh, still very dangerous ways. For instance, here in the Netherlands, we now have a party uh, which is growing really, really quickly. It's called Forum for Democracy. And um, they have publicly and unashamedly asked for purging of journalists from public media and from what they call leftist teachers from schools. I do think that there that is a frontal attack to our European values, to the values of democracy and um, to a democratic system. And I do think that we have to be really vi vi vigilant um, to not give them an extra centimeter of move. And in that sense, the elections of uh, uh, May 23rd to May 26th are going to be extremely important. We know that the liberal uh, fraction, according to the polls, is going to grow. And that's really good news. But we also know that the extreme right parties, that the populist parties, that the anti-EU parties are also going to grow. And um, that is, in my opinion, um, uh, a dangerous uh, development. Um, and I think that we have to remain, uh, remain very cautious and remain, uh, well, what I just said, very, very vigilant. More questions. Oh, about uh, defense. Uh, a very good one. Does defense include intercultural dialogue for conflict prevention? And that is a question from, uh, again, from Rosa P. Mondes. Um, yes, I would, I would say so. I do think that uh, a, a consistent and sustainable and, and definitely oriented, not in conflict, but in peace, defense policy does need to include intercultural dialogue for conflict prevention. Uh, we have a very recent history of conflict in Europe. Um, we cannot forget that just 30 years ago uh, was there a terrible conflict in the Balkans. Um, thankfully, a lot has been done and uh, peace has been gained and uh, maintained. And some of the Balkan countries are right now in the European Union, high Croatia, and others are in the process of uh, accession, like Serbia. Um, but it is something that we, we as Europeans cannot think that it's just something of the past. So yes, absolutely, I do think that any, consist uh, any coherent and comprehensive European defense policy should include conflict prevention, not only in third countries, but also here in Europe. Let's see, more questions. Uh, Julie Lomax, uh, what do you think about Brexit and how do you think the EU can continue to engage with the UK post-Brexit? Uh, well, for me, Brexit is a drama. And it's not only a drama from the political perspective, which, you know, it's, 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 it's almost like a, being in a Monty Python uh, sketch, but then permanently. Um, it's not only an economic drama, Brexit has not even going into force and we're already seeing um, the terrible economic co consequences on both sides of the channel. But for me, it's mostly a human drama. There are millions of people in the UK, but also not in the UK, British citizens abroad or people with family in the UK who have no idea what their future is going to look like. They have no idea if they have a right to a pension. They have no idea if they will be able to keep working there. They have no idea if they will be able to keep receiving medical treatment in the European Union when they are living here as British expats. And we know a lot about that in Spain. Um, and if I think about myself and my family, and I think about the fact that several parties in the Netherlands now are proposing a Nexit, it really sends chills down my spine. I am an expat, I'm not a Dutch citizen, I'm still a Spanish citizen. And I do wonder what would happen if Nexit became a reality for me as well. What would my life look like? What would my, uh, uh, my future look like? How would that affect my family? So I have full empathy for the people that are being affected already by what's going on in the United Kingdom. 
and um, I, I really hope that that uh, Brexit is is uh, the last of these dramas to happen, and that we will never have to see this in any of our uh, remaining European Union member states. Oh, and the second part of the question, how do you think the EU can continue to engage with the UK post-Brexit? Well, I, I do think that we have to uh, um, treat the, the, the UK um, as a partner, because it will keep being a partner. We cannot forget that the EU and Britain will share borders. We have Ireland, of course, that is uh, related to conflict as well, into intercultural dialogue, into conflict prevention. It is, uh, it is definitely a, a, a hotspot. Um, which cannot be ignored and we have to um, take care with all of us together that uh, no form of conflict resumes in, uh, in Ireland and Northern Ireland and in the rest of the United King Kingdom. But I also think, and uh, well, that's my personal view, but I, I do think that that's the way that a lot of Europeans feel. Um, they have to go back to the drawing board. They have to renegotiate. They will have to find their new role in the global scene. And that will be as an ally of the European Union. And we will be and are ready to be generous about that. But they will have to do it on their own. Yeah. I think that we have a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to take one last question. Let me see. Yes, um, uh, uh, also from uh, Jasmina Lashovic. Um, she's asking me, in your opinion, what could be the role of the European Union in protecting artists which are under pressure from their local governments? Referring to the case of uh, uh, rapper Valtonic, if I'm familiar with this case. Yes, I am familiar with, it, familiar with this case. It's a, it's a Spanish case uh, of a rapper uh, who was sentenced to three and a half years in prison for writing lyrics. Um, that allegedly praised terror groups and insults the monarchy. Um, personally, I believe that uh, uh, insulting the monarchy uh, should not be a crime that should put you in jail. Um, I do believe that uh, when you are clearly supporting in any way the work of uh, terror groups, uh, that could be probably should be case for at least uh, an investigation. And then it's up to independent courts to decide whether that was in breach of the law. On the monarchy, yes, they are citizens and uh, they should be open to critique. And as long as the critique is not uh, uh, calling uh, for violence, just like for any other citizen, um, I do think that that should not be a crime. Um, in the Netherlands, we have managed, thanks to the role played by my party, to um, uh, extract that sort of special protection for the monarchy from our uh, law. I'm very happy about that. And I think that uh, for systems which are still um, monarchies instead of republics, that's definitely the way to go. Citizens should have equal rights and equal duties. And I think that was that because I don't see any new questions uh, coming in. Well, then uh, with that, I, um, I'm going to say goodbye to all of you. Uh, it was really nice to do. I am sorry about the glitch at the beginning that I had to uh, uh, change uh, uh, rooms, but I hope that you could hear me all right. I hope that uh, my answers um, were clear to your questions. And um, if you want to find me or continue the dialogue with me, you can find me online. I'm on Twitter. I am on Facebook. My name is Raquel Garcia. Hermida van der Wallen, it's, uh, it's uh, quite, a, uh, quite a mouthful. Um, and you can always shoot me an email to Raquel in Europa at gmail.com. But all of that is on my Twitter, and I believe the colleagues from the Culture Action Network um, have tweeted about this. Uh, so any questions, they're always welcome. Thank you so much for your questions this afternoon, and uh, see you at the polls on May 23rd to May 26th. Bye, Europe.